G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I'm covering a topic which I've actually had requested quite a lot of times, mostly by BIM managers or model managers, trying to better control where and how they store their data in their elements and how they show that data using tags in Revit. So in this case, I'm gonna be talking about the difference and the way that I use keynotes, uh, material keynotes and element keynotes, also category tags, multi-category tags using shared parameters and type marks. Um, and hopefully this will give you a better idea of how you can manage this data within your company and make sure that people actually have confidence in knowing how and where they should be tagging fields from. So today I'll just be using Revit 2020, but most of the principles I cover will come from lots of different builds of Revit. Um, I'll also be using a sample project which you can find over on my course platform uh, for free uh, if you wanna see how I set up my data as well. Anyway, let's jump in. So let's just begin by looking at keynotes. Um, so usually I would be using keynotes in a few different scenarios. Um, often it's when I wanna take advantage of a keynote legend or a keynote file. So typically a keynote file um, is a great way to manage codes and descriptions if you just want someone to manage the code only. For example, in this particular keynote file, um, cam, security camera, all I need to do is get the keynote of cam in the object and I don't have to maintain a description. Now, keynotes are really good in that scenario, but if you're working in a very bespoke scenario where you want to be able to change the descriptions of objects very quickly and easily, sometimes a keynote file can be a little bit risky because it means that users will constantly have to revisit this file and modify it. Often companies will set up a really good keynoting standard for a baseline and then copy the file on a project basis, and then the users can modify the keynote file to suit. Um, this is for a really big project scale. I would say smaller projects, keynotes sometimes can be a little bit more effort than they're worth in that scenario. However, if you can template your company into a system that's really standardized and doesn't actually need that many changes per code, you might be okay in that scenario. Some people use keynotes for different things like managing specification codes instead of just these standard scheduling codes. Um, it's up to your company how they manage them. Often for keynotes, um, I'll just have a code and a number so that you can create sub variations of codes as well. Um, my master system is a little bit more complex. I usually have a prefix on the front of my keynote, which allows me to filter them by type. So for example, my furniture is F dot, my joinery is J dot, etc. Um, in this case, you can use keynotes in a few different ways. So you can use element keynotes, uh, which will lift the value out of the elements keynote property. So for example, if I look at my shelving here, um, in this case, I believe, yep, I have a keynote of j.she. This is stored in the keynote field and is able to be uh, referenced to a keynote file. So in this example, you can see that it's aligned itself to a joinery shelving code and the description is automatically picking this up. Now you also have other fields like description. This isn't actually the keynote description. So you can use these fields for different purposes if you want. Typically, I tend to align most of these fields unanimously. Um, but this is a, a lot of extra work on big companies or big projects where you're not gonna wanna have to double or triple handle data. So I usually recommend that you identify which field is the valid description for an object and which field is the valid code. Now, often I will actually manage um, a keynote alongside a tagging field, which is usually a shared parameter. In this case, mine is bg underscore dat underscore code one. This is usually locked to the element in my loadable families, um, so I can keep this uh, related to my keynote at all times. So in this case, in the family itself, in the type properties, um, I usually actually have this already set up and I use a formula. So in this case, I say that my code one is equal to keynote and instantly this locks in that value. And if this changes, then so will the code as well. So it keeps those two elements related while still giving you the flexibility of modifying the base keynote of the element. Now, some companies will use uh, different tagging types of fields. For example, maybe in Australia, someone might use the national specification code reference as the keynote instead, and then they'll have their tagging field as a shared parameter instead. So it depends on how the company is set up, uh, but I find this is a really effective way to make sure that whilst you do have a keynote available for the system of keynoting, you still have this field available in more flexible places. For example, one limitation with um, keynotes is in a keynote tag, you can only include the keynote value and description. In a multi-category tag, you can include a lot of different types of parameters for an element. So sometimes you might wanna benefit from both systems at once by connecting these fields. Now, 
Having said that, there is a pretty big weakness in this system um, that does have to be managed carefully, which is that if you're dealing with a system family, for example, a wall, um, in this case, you can't actually connect these two parameters together without using add-ins or something like Dynamo to push the data across the fields constantly. So for example, in this wall, whilst I do have a keynote and also a code, I am manually managing the relationship between these fields. So if one updates here, the other one doesn't update here. Now there is a really great add-in. Um, I haven't tried it before because it is paid, but it's called Property Wizard. Uh, Maybe worth looking at it if you're in a big company and want to try something like that out. Um, another layer of confusion you can add if you're not careful is the relationship between the element keynote and the material keynote. So in this case, I have an element keynote, which is just WPA or wall petition or petition wall. Um, but also inside the wall, if I go to its, its properties, I have in this case just a 90 millimeter painted layer of the wall. This is a more common residential approach where the wall stud is just the paint um, and you don't have the paint layers of the wall because usually you just set out the stud zone as a 90 millimeter wall. But if I go into this actual property of the wall, notice in this case that the keynote for this particular element of the wall isn't WPA. It's actually a paint finish. And that's because when I tag the face of this element, I'm gonna be calling out its material finish. So you do need to be careful. Um, for example, is this gonna be like a WPA material keynote? Probably not. So sometimes you might have keynotes that line up between the elements. For example, maybe a timber floor finish. You may wish to have the keynote available on an element basis here. But at the same time, you may also wish for it to be present in the material as well, so that you can use a material keynote tag on the face surface of the element. But of course, again, more data to manually coordinate and maintain. So this can get really convoluted if you're not careful. A lot of companies will say no material keynotes, only element keynotes, just to keep things simple. But you do lose the benefit of being able to surface material tag. So in this case, if I go annotate keynote, material keynote, being able to lift that keynote from the actual material in the object is quite a powerful thing to be able to do. It also means you can do things like tag wall paint in multiple wall types without having to manage the element keynote on that basis as well. So I do find that usually material keynotes are worth using as well as element keynotes. Having said that, um, usually I will use multi-category tags as well. So in this case, this project, I'm not using one, but if I just go to load, in this case, my standard multi-category tag, this will call out that code parameter, which in this case is a shared parameter. So remember that in a lot of my loadable families, this is actually a connected parameter. So if I isolate, uh, maybe just find say this joinery shelf, for example, it is gonna be coordinated between the keynote value. So if I do go to the shelf and update its keynote code, say I give it a one, in this case, the keynote and the shelf code in the multi-category tag, they're connected. So this does dynamically update the value. So it is worth being aware that this is still a really valuable system when it's managed and set up carefully. Having said that, that means you're gonna to have to establish this relationship in every single family you build. So it does require a lot of intent in how things are set up. Now, another really common field that people tend to work with is type mark. Type mark is mostly intended to be used when you want something to have a unique code on a project basis. So if you have wall types, for example, this is a really good field if you want this just to be a unique value to the project. Having said that, type mark isn't a field that you can universally just use across all your families. Be aware that things like a joinery shelf, in this case, may have a type mark present, but if I load this family into another project, the type mark doesn't exist at the family level. So if I open the family itself, you're not gonna find a type mark available to populate. So this field really isn't intended to be stored at a library level. So you have to be very careful when you use this field and when you don't. To be honest, I almost never use type mark. I will mostly try and standardize my coding conventions in my families and my templates quite carefully. So for example, a 90 millimeter stud wall on a project, in my opinion, should just be the same code on every single project you work on. If your company is invested in setting up standards like wall types and wall libraries, then it's possible. Having said that, you might need to get your principles to get more used to seeing coding systems that don't necessarily look complete on a project. So for example, maybe the first wall type in your wall catalog is a 92 millimeter steel stud wall. And maybe on a project, you don't actually use that type of wall. Well, your principal might have to say, if your wall types begin at five, there's a reason for that. It's because you have a bigger picture 
in how you manage your walls in the company. But some principals will say, I want that to be wall type one. Otherwise the contractors will ask me, where's wall types one through to four. So if there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to using type mark versus not using type mark. But in my opinion, I, I don't typically use it just because the users have to control what those values are on a project by project basis. And often that just won't be done effectively. It becomes a BIM manager's problem when really they could just capture it at a company wide level. We also have um, category tags, which I find quite useful when you want a very particular tag to be used with a very particular category of element. I don't typically recommend trying to build too many multi-category tags. Um, really multi-category tags, their only purpose is to universally tag elements that should be tagged in a uni universal way. So for example, furniture, plumbing fixtures, all the bits and pieces, the fixtures on a project, sure, multi-category tag their code or keynote them. But a door, for example, is usually tagged in a very particular way. In this case, I'm tagging the mark of the door. Um, now, whilst you might tag the mark of lots of different types of elements, um, usually a door tag will look different to a window tag. In most cases, on this job, it's the same because I use W to imply it's a window, but often companies will have different shape tags, different appearance tags. Um, the way you might tag a floor or a ceiling is quite different as well. I think there might be a floor tag on this job. No, so if I load in my particular floor tag that I use, it has some very particular fields to it. So I have one that actually tells you the FFL um, of the floor. Um, so if I, in this case, tag my floor, I don't only get the code of the floor, but I also get the level of the floor as well. So it's a raised finish. So it has a slightly higher FFL. Um, so in this case, uh, you really only want to use these sorts of tags when you're tagging a floor. So a category tag makes sense in these scenarios. But at the same time, do remember that you can use things like material keynotes to lift out the finish. Now, another consideration that's really important to make is how do you manage scheduling and which fields do you use to manage those schedules? Well, for example, one type of, not a schedule, but a legend you can use as a keynote legend. And this is sort of the reason why I usually do still try to use keynotes where I can, because you get these automatic legends which respond to the codes on the drawings, which are really, really powerful if you set them up right. So for example, if I go and add a keynote tag on an element basis, um, not to a bed because it has no code. I'll just find something that does have a code, like a toilet. Um, obviously on its own, this toilet tag doesn't really mean a lot to someone that doesn't know what that represents. A keynote legend goes to the keynote file and tells us what that element is and adds it to the drawing. Now having said that, it won't do something. So a keynote legend doesn't do quantity takeoff. It won't tell you how many of those objects are on the drawing. It just says, is the element tagged? If so, it shows up in the legend. So these are more for managing what a code means on a drawing, not doing quantity takeoff. When you get to quantity takeoff, you're really more so gonna be looking at shared parameters, uh, which you can use to filter and sort your schedules. So for example, in my standard, all my furniture is F dot. So I can use this to take advantage of how I break down my schedules. I believe in this case, I do have a fixture schedule. I do. So in this case, I'm actually sorting by a multi-category value. So I'm going by code in this case. So if I go to my fields, I believe you're gonna keynote as well. You can, so I could do it by keynote if I wanted to. In this case, I'm just using my, my multi-category tags. I usually find it a bit more reliable. Um, but in this case, I'm filtering by does the code begin with F dot and then just sorting by code and comment. So in this case, you can see that I can get a lot more fields out of this schedule and a lot more meaning out of it than a keynote legend. I can get quantities as well. I'm actually counting them in this case. So I do have the special count field in here. And I'm also tallying this um, with no calculation. Um, just so I can see the total count of the rows of each of these objects, because I'm also sorting this schedule uh, with the itemized setting ticked off, which means it's gonna group all the elements by code. And as a result, I do get a meaningful quantity takeoff from this schedule. Um, keep in mind, I, I can only place this on sheets. It won't respond to how I tag my sheet. So the purpose of how we're using our codes here is quite different. Um, but ultimately, this is really, I guess, the way that I manage my tagging systems. Um, it will depend on the client and the project scale. Often, the bigger the project is, the more simple you're going to want to make your system so that you run into less chances for errors because on big projects, you're going to get less time to manage your errors. But remember that if you can get as much of your coding into your family library and your template as possible, you're going to save a lot of time, a lot of frustration, and you're going to minimize the risk that users just don't bother to put codes on objects. 
Having said that, if your company manages things like Excel schedules, um, which they want to line up to elements in Revit, it's really important that your BIM team does have a good relationship with the people that are managing those files, because ultimately there really should be a strong relationship between those two documents, both at a company-wide level, but also at a project-wide scale. So when you go on a project and someone creates a variation for a chair, you should have a process in place for what should happen in the BIM model, in the project keynote file, in the families, there should be a process for coordinating those. Otherwise you'll find that people just go and generate heaps of codes in Excel and all the codes in the model are wrong and you don't find this out until you start going to tag elements really late. And it leads to a lot of work and a lot of confusion. No one knows if the right objects have been used in the right place. So you really should be thinking about your codes as early as possible and minimizing the amount of types of codes you need, but getting the most out of the platform in order to show the codes on objects. So hopefully this has been a good way to sort of show a few considerations you should make um, when using keynotes, tags, type marks, all sorts of fields, um, which will also hopefully better help you set up your systems in your company. So hopefully that was a useful video, especially for BIM and model managers out there. Um, I know it probably wasn't the most exciting video, but it is a very common question I get. So I did want to make this video so I can provide it to people when they ask me this question in future as well. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future similar videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.